Hey, you guys want to see my video? Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. <laughs> Hello friends, welcome back to Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. I'm a professional artist and master educator attempting to bring you the best in art historical content. If you like this one, please interact with it. Much appreciation. What do I know? I color for a living. You know, it's interesting how we can read and research and find out things about a historical figure and just feel like we have a some sort of a connection or an understanding of that individual on a deeper level than maybe others might. And there are a few artists that I feel like I have that sort of compassion for, understanding of, these kind of unique characters that whether they're loved or hated, respected, in, in certain circles and disrespected in others, I have a certain understanding of, all right, I, I get where they're coming from. I get where their emotional being sort of resides. And one such individual is the topic of today. And you know, because you clicked on the video, that today we're going to talk about Michelangelo Bonarotti, the Renaissance master. And, uh, you know, he is an individual that because he's so recognized as synonymous with with being an artist and an art and all of that sort of thing we feel like you know we get him we know him here's his art we get it but it's a lot deeper than that and so today I want to talk a little bit about and this is a kind of a broad overview a broad brushstroke I'm not going to get down into the deep crevices about every single one of his works. I mean, he spent years working on a single piece or series of pieces. So, I mean, to, to talk about uh, anything in real great depth is going to take multiple videos, and I've done a couple on them already. You can check them out. Uh, they're down in the descriptions. But anyway, in this one, we're just going to focus on a kind of a broad overview so you get the gist one of the guys that I really get, Michelangelo Bonarotti. Born under really unique circumstances, Michelangelo Bonarotti's mother was too sick to care for him after his birth and so he was placed in the care of a wet nurse. After some time, he would be reintroduced into the family. However, sadly, his mother died when he was six years old. At a young age, he was very into art, but his father was not so encouraging. He and one of Michelangelo's uncles felt that an artist in the family would be a disgrace, and they often beat him to kind of persuade him away from the career path. However, at the age of 13, he was apprenticed to the Galindio brothers, who were fresco painters in Florence. During his year under their tutelage, he would learn drawing through copying and observing things around him. The following year, he went to study at the Lorenzo de' Medici Art Academy under the instruction of Bertoldo di Giovanni, who was a student of the renowned Renaissance artist and sculptor Donatello Bardi. Side note, it was at this art academy he was about 16 years old, and he was looking at another student's artwork. Michelangelo made an unpleasant comment about Pietro Torrigiano's work and Michelangelo was punched square in the nose. So hard that it would be crooked the rest of his life. Don't mess with the volcano, my man. Cause I will go What? Alright, Michelangelo may have been a prick, but he was no intellectual slouch. Michelangelo Bonarotti was a sculptor, poet, architect, painter and inventor. Not only did he work in these areas, but he excelled in every single one of them. After returning home in 1492, Michelangelo would receive special permission from the church to dissect cadavers. 
Now he wouldn't do this very long because it made him quite sick to his stomach and it greatly affected his diet, so he was done with it. And it was upon his arrival back home that he would meet one of the biggest intellectual inspirations to his work, a Dominican monk by the name of Savonrola. On May the 23rd, 1498, Savonrola would be burned at the stake for opposing Pope Alexander VI. After Savonrola's execution, and considering his close ties with Savonrola, he felt unsafe and so he had to get out of town. So he fled to Bologna and he made some sculptures there and was very much in need of protection for a period of time. But eventually, he would find his way back to Florence. He would work in Florence for a little bit and then find his way to Rome where he would create his Pietà at the age of 25. This work was originally designed as a burial marker but ended up being a fixture in the Vatican. And this is the only work that he ever signed. He went in and he heard other people attributing this work to another artist and he could not handle it. And so he came back in the night and he wrote his name across the sash running across Mary's chest. However, he did regret this selfish act and never signed another work again the rest of his life. He would leave Rome for Florence once again at the age of 26. He would begin his career in Florence known as a loner. He once said, I have no friends and I want none. He hated honors. He didn't want any sort of public praise of himself or his work, although I think deep down inside, clearly he did. Otherwise, he wouldn't have wrote his name across the Pietà. Anyway, he was remembered being very temperamental, a devout Christian, a hypochondriac, very forceful and suspicious of others anti-social, blunt, kind of a slob, yet a very hard worker. It is said that he would work so hard and long that he would go many days without even undressing or washing, even at a time when people would take a bath weekly. He was not big on hygiene, and when he would take his boots off, a layer of skin would come off with them. On occasion, he compared himself to a scarecrow with a scraggly beard, although he did have fairly extreme wealth. Michelangelo's lifetime earnings were 50,000 large gold florins. But what the heck does that really even mean? To put it in perspective, in American dollars as of 2021, the average American income is $70,000. You know, usually over the course of a lifetime, one or two million dollars is about what you're going to earn. Over the course of Michelangelo's lifetime, he would have earned somewhere in the neighborhood of 17 million dollars American in today's money. So that's pretty substantial wealth. And he was very thrifty with his money. Living off the very basics, water was kind of unclean. It was safer to drink wine. So he would often just have a meal of a piece of bread and wine and that was it. Has a five-year plan. What is it? Don't die? On August 16th of 1501, Michelangelo would sign the contract to begin one of his great masterworks, the 13-foot, 5-inch high Statue of David. He had acquired this block of damaged marble from some other artists that had attempted a David but failed miserably. I have another video that goes more in depth on that, so you can check that one out, but... Once that work was completed, he was looking for more work to do so he would accept a commission to create a mural for the city of Florence. Now, strangely enough, I also have a video on that. Both of those videos and more can be found down in the description. Shut up. So we fast forward a little bit here and the story picks up with Michelangelo abandoning the fresco project to go to Rome for Pope Julius II, where he was asked to create a sculptural project. But once he got to Rome and invested a ton of money into purchasing 90 wagon loads of marble to create this enormous tomb project for the Pope as they wanted him to create a fresco painting before doing that project. And Michelangelo, probably rightfully so, felt like he was getting jerked around so he's like, screw this, I'm leaving and he went back to Florence. Well, this time the Pope was the most powerful person in the world and he's saying, hey, We need you to come back right now and do this project. And Michelangelo is basically ghosted him hard. Eventually, after a little bit of time, Michelangelo and the Pope decided to meet in Bologna. Kind of a neutral turf situation. He was commissioned to do a life-size bronze statue of the Pope, which he had done. 
Sadly, this work does not exist any longer as it was melted down a couple years after it was made. The Pope was really leaning on Michelangelo to come back to Rome with him to finish a couple projects there as well. In February of 1508, Michelangelo was leaving Bologna for Florence, but by May 10th of that year, he was on his way to Rome, so the discussions must have went in a positive direction. Now, the first project that he needed to complete was in the personal sanctuary of the Pope. This was going to be an 85 foot high, 133 foot long by 43 foot wide ceiling that was currently decorated with a bunch of gold leaf stars on a blue painted background. Now, initially what they wanted to do was have him paint the apostles around the outside edges, but Michelangelo said, no, that's a stupid idea. I'm not painting that. Just let me do what I want to do and it'll be awesome. Which was completely unheard of at that time. Like nobody had that kind of deal. Especially at the Vatican. Especially with the Pope. But most people aren't Michelangelo and it all worked out. Side note, for Michelangelo did not paint this laying down. He painted it standing up. So quit saying that. Anyway. What are you talking about, Willis? Why did they have one of the great sculptors doing a painting? Basically, it was a hit job. There were artists that wanted to make Michelangelo look foolish. They wanted him to look as though he was incompetent as an artist. And so they wanted to set him up for failure. But little did they know that it would blow up in their faces and he would create one of the greatest fresco paintings ever created in the history of mankind. Now this was a four year long endeavor to create the painting and there were a lot of ups and downs and fine detailed points to explain how this great painting even came to be that I'm not going to get into in this video, but I will make a video that explains all of those details in the future. But the 14 phase painting was finished after four years of labor on October the 31st, 1512. The impressive collection of 343 figures was unprecedented, especially on an arched ceiling like this. The images in these panels were influenced not only from the Bible, but also from Plato, Savonarola, as well as his own personal belief system. As you look around at the figures that were created, several of these figures are very androgynous. This is possibly linked to the bisexual nature of classical mythology, there are also Christian doctrines that consider the androgynous being one of superiority, and it is also a fact that Michelangelo had two very brief relationships, one with a man and one with a woman. At any rate, once this was completed, he was able to go forward with the Pope's tomb project. Probably the most iconic of the pieces that he created for that was his sculpture of Moses. Over the years, the tomb project had been modified various times from something really, really huge and continued to shrink. When Pope Julius died in 1513, the tomb project once again was modified. When the project still wasn't completed after 10 years, the Pope's family was going to take legal action against Michelangelo when he created a fourth, fifth, and sixth plan for the project that was completed in 1545. And if you're keeping score, yes, it took 40 years for him to complete the project. There were other projects that took place between the Sistine Chapel and the completion of the tomb. For example, his fresco painting of the Last Judgment, which is also in the Sistine Chapel. Again, I'm not going to get into all the nuts and bolts of that, but this altarpiece that was 2,250 square feet of fresco that included 400 figures would be revealed to the public on Christmas Day, 1541. At the age of 89, the elderly master returns to his artistic roots as he develops plans and the rough sculpture of yet another Pietà. He was working on the project long and hard hours. He was somewhat under the weather when he would finally go to bed and remain there for six full days. He would pass away with this work like several others unfinished. He would pass away in Rome and his remains would be transferred to Florence where he is still entombed today. Without question, Michelangelo is viewed as one of the greatest artists of all time. Personally, I consider him at the top of the list. 
but Michelangelo being Michelangelo, as great as he was, he would see himself as a, quote, poor and noble and crazy man. I tell you, complex dude, but man, I love that story. Thanks for letting me share it with you. So what do you think? <laughs> it's pretty cool, I guess.